This week, the world celebrates Earth Day. In fact, April 22nd is the 50th anniversary of the first Earth Day. In 1970, at the behest of Wisconsin Senator Gaylord Nelson, an estimated 20 million people across the United States gathered to raise awareness for environmental protection and preservation. This first Earth Day was a catalyst for the modern environmental movement. By the end of the 1970s, the Environmental Protection Agency had been created, and the Clean Air, Clean Water, and Endangered Species Acts passed in Congress. This is Caitlin Phillips with the Oxford Comment. Our episode today features four interviews with scholars and environmentalists from across the conservation spectrum. While we are specifically speaking on the importance of conservation and preserving our planet, we would be remiss if we did not briefly address the current crisis facing humanity, COVID-19. With many of us around the world continuing to quarantine for the health and safety of our communities, we can at least take this moment to note that it is possible to come together to solve a crisis. Is this a glimmer of hope for the future of conservation and the fight against climate change? Our first guest is Ted Steinberg, professor of history and law at Case Western Reserve University and the author of Down to Earth, Nature's Role in American History. Here with us to talk about the early history of conservation in the United States, particularly the utilitarian approach of Theodore Roosevelt and how it conflicted with the spiritual approach of his advisor, John Muir. Hi, Ted. Would you like to tell us why you wrote Down to Earth? I wrote the book to make sure that people understood the role that plants and animals, climate and weather, soil and water played in the American past. I thought this was important because most of the American history that I've read, you find that the natural world really, by and large, did not enter into the thinking of historians. To the extent that nature existed in these, say, textbooks, was sort of confined to the inside cover where there usually be a map of the United States sort of glued in there. But otherwise, it might be a reference to Teddy Roosevelt or something conservation, but nature in terms of plants and animals, soil, water, simply didn't enter into the thinking of those writing books at that time. Teddy Roosevelt actually relied on two people primarily in terms of his environmental thinking. One was a professional forester named Gifford Pinchot. He's often mentioned in American history textbooks and has been for a long time. Pinchot was a scientist and he embraced a kind of utilitarian stance when it came to the matter of conservation. And by that, I mean he was a practically oriented person who believed that natural resources, like forests, for example, they needed to be used rationally and efficiently in order to bolster production, economic growth, and ultimately the success of capitalism. So that was one person that uh, Teddy Roosevelt relied on. And the other person, of course, Teddy Roosevelt turned to for advice on the environment was John Muir. Muir was the founder of the Sierra Club back in the 1890s. He was raised a devout upbringing uh, in Scotland, came to the United States as a young child. He believed that we are all God's people. And what he meant by that, by we at least, was not just human beings, but animals, bears, wolves, uh, mountain lions, what have you, plants, animals, but essentially all four and fauna were equal, that human beings, in other words, had no more right to exist than the plant and animal world, uh, and that the government had a moral responsibility to preserve nature because a natural world enriched human life. So it was these two competing understandings of nature uh, that were kind of swirling around there in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, And for the most part, I think it's fair to say that the utilitarian stance was the one that was ultimately embraced, not just by uh, Ted Roosevelt, but by conservationists in in the United States writ large. And it's come really to dominate uh, over the sort of thinking that John Muir was putting forward. And even Muir's thinking on this issue kind of gravitated a bit more toward the utilitarian, practically oriented position. The utilitarian approach won out in the end, in large part because it was consistent with the needs of a capitalist socio-ecological order. Now, that's not to say that people still can't derive spiritual value from the natural world or that there aren't conservationists who derive some sort of spiritual value from the natural world. You see this, for example, in some of the more radical environmental groups 
like Earth First or the Earth Liberation Front, who actually have a philosophy that derives very much from the thinking of someone like Muir, which is to say that they don't think that human beings should have some sort of privileged position with respect to nature. That, in other words, human beings are no different in their way of thinking than, than plants and animals and the rest of it. But that said, I mean, there's still relatively marginal, I think, in terms of how things are unfolding with respect to human beings and their relationship with the natural world. Thinking about these two different philosophies, utilitarianism and preservation, I think it can only take you so far. I wrote the book to kind of get beyond Ted Roosevelt, Gifford Pinchot, and, and, and John Muir. I really wrote the book because I think the driving force here with respect to human beings and the natural world is the uh, capitalist system, which is a relentlessly maximizing system that's been predicated on um, it's got a very long-standing shift away from direct interactions with the natural world so that people could gain a subsistence, feed themselves, clothe themselves, provide shelter for themselves. Uh, a shift from that direct uh, relationship with the local environment to a much more indirect, global, and impersonal relationship with the natural world that's now mediated by powerful central states of one kind or another, and especially by very powerful economic uh, institutions, uh, for example, like corporations, which of course shape to a very large degree uh, how human beings interact with the natural world on this planet. Now, the capitalist system, of course, has many benefits in terms of the creation of just extraordinary uh, economic growth and monumental wealth, but it's not been very good when, it's con when it comes to the issue of distributing that wealth equally, and it's certainly not been very good at dealing with the ecological fallout uh, of all this uh, economic growth. Our next two guests focus on the Murian approach to conservation, a more spiritual connection mentioned by Professor Steinberg. First, we have Belden Lane, Professor Emeritus of Theological Studies, American Religion, and History of Spirituality at St. Louis University and author of The Great Conversation, Nature and the Care of the Soul, who joins us to discuss how his Christian beliefs influence his relationship with nature. We're here with Belden Lane. Belden, could you please introduce yourself for us? Yes, I'm a self-confessed tree hugger who loves wilderness backpacking in the Ozarks near where I live. I'm also a storyteller and a retired professor of theology who taught for 35 years with the Jesuits at St. Louis University. In your new book, The Great Conversation, you talk about a close relationship with a tree that you call Grandfather. Can you tell us more about Grandfather? Yeah, I, I've been interested for years in what Thomas Berry called the Great Conversation. The idea that, you know, we as humans can renew our forgotten ability to converse with other creatures in the natural world, like trees. He says we've dropped out of the Great Conversation. We're talking only to ourselves. We're not talking to the rivers. We aren't listening to the wind and the stars. And he says that's a tremendous loss. It signals our spiritual poverty and allows us to destroy a world we once held in reverence. So my connecting with a particular tree I call grandfather is so important to me right now because of the ecological crisis we're facing. Given the rate of climate change, environmental pollution, and species extinction, all of us as species are being thrown together like passengers on a runaway train. We're forced to talk to each other, recognizing that we're a community that will live or die together. But this 100-year-old male eastern cottonwood tree lives in the park across the street from my house. We met 25 years ago at a time of mutual crisis. My mother was in a nursing home dying of cancer with Alzheimer's disease. He was dealing with a lightning strike and windstorm that had just blown down one of the two great trunks growing from his roots. There's a huge 12-foot-high wound that's still left in his side. And that's what first drew me to him. A common hurt opened the door between us. So for years, I've gone over every night to spend time with him, standing in the hollow of this tree, emptying out the burdens of the day and trusting this tree with the care of my soul. I've apprenticed myself to him, if you will, exploring deeper ways of communicating with each other. 
On your chapter in Caves, you talk about Ignatius of Loyola, and he sort of has this epiphany while alone and maybe a little scared. What do you think it is about being alone in nature that, you know, sort of allows you to connect to a wider world? Yeah, for years, uh, my chief spiritual practice, uh, along with contemplative prayer, has been solo backpacking trips into wilderness. I don't need to go very far or for very long, but getting away alone in wilderness, being put at risk to some extent, I, not that I'm doing anything really dangerous, but being exposed to the natural world and its beauty, its wonder, its uh, never knowing what to expect has a way of, of, on one level, putting me on edge, on another level of taking me deeply into my true self. And I always come back. My wife delights in my going because I always come back a better person uh, for everybody else as well. And in this chapter on caves, I'm uh, intrigued at Ignatius Loyola went through an interesting two-part spiritual experience in a cave outside the Spanish town of Manresa. He was 30 years old at a major turning point in his life, and this is where everything initially fell apart. He spent several months inside a cave that symbolized his entrance into the dark night of the soul. Uh, months earlier, he'd been wounded by cannon fire in a battle and had ended his career as a soldier. And here he comes face to face with how hollow his life really is, entering into deep depression. The cave is a tomb, a place of death and loss, where he's alone, where he's taken to the depths of himself. But it's also this cave, the place where he has a spiritual breakthrough and starts to write his spiritual exercises. The cave becomes a womb as well, where something new is born. There's a vision there in which he's smitten by the beauty of creation, seeing God in all things. So I'm intrigued that uh, Carl Jung says this often happens in the dark, constricted places of our lives. If we don't run away, it's where we encounter the light. The interior experience of the cave drives us out into a renewed engagement with the outer world, with a larger community. Can you tell me about some of these experiences and how they led to deepening your conservation efforts or, you know, why your spirituality connects so much with your desire for conservation? In my own Christian tradition, there's a deep conviction. Uh, you, you see it from uh, somebody like Hildegard of Bingen in the 12th century to Teilhard de Chardin in the last century, that the world around us isn't a collection of objects. It's a communion or a, a communion of subjects. It's alive family deeply involved in interrelationships that honor every member. But unfortunately, through much of Western thought, there's also been a very destructive dualism that wants to separate things into disconnected parts. So in religion, we've often distanced the sacred from the profane, the spiritual from the earthy, going over this world for the sake of the next. And in economics, we've separated the human sphere from the rest of the world that we perceive as mere goods and resources to be used at our disposal. The others don't really count. What deeply roots me in Christianity is the idea of the incarnation, the insistence that we find God not outside of, but within the world of nature and flesh and blood relationships. We know God not apart from the world, but fully within it. So I, I think of those Eastern Orthodox icons of the Transfiguration, where not only is Jesus lit up with a transfigured light, but the disciples as well, and the whole mountain, bushes, rocks, and trees, everything ablaze with the glory of God. And our second guest is Lufty Radwan of Willowbrook Farm in Oxfordshire, England, who converses with us about the importance of his Muslim faith to his conservation practices, expressed most powerfully through his business, the first halal farm in the UK. Okay, Lufty, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself um, and your work at Willowbrook Farm. Okay, well, my work at Willowbrook Farm is in a way a sort of culmination of our life. I've always, I think as a child, felt very close to nature. It was very important to me, that connection with spirituality. And it led me to go down a route, studied geography and environmental sciences. I uh, ended up lecturing at Oxford for about 15 years, where I did my DPhil prior to that. And my connection was very much to the academic side of resource management, um, soil and water management. I worked in parts of Africa, West Africa, on reforestation programs and developed a, a sort of academic connection to the issues of 
society and community and how they interact with the environment and how we conserve resources. And in a way, all of that was driven, or at least it built upon my own Islamic faith and my, my principles about that relationship, that sense of stewardship that we have of nature. But on a, a national stage, I, I sort of sometimes felt frustrated. So at the age of 40, myself and my wife, we decided to, to sell our home, buy a caravan and establish a small naturally farmed, ethically farmed family farm business just north of Oxford. And that's where we are now. We've also opened our doors as a sort of educator. We have a lot of open days and events where people can come and see the farm and learn a little bit about what we do. That is just amazing. Um, so the Willowbrook Farm mission, um, part of it is to take seriously the role of steward for God's creation and to produce food naturally and sustainably and to be grateful for the food that you receive. How is that mission put into practice on an everyday basis? And why do you think this is so important? Well, I think it's at the heart of really what it means to me to be to be a human being, but certainly also to be a Muslim and to put into practice what I believe are the, the principles that we find in Islam. We, we know that the Quran, for example, if I, if I can, I'll mention a verse in the Quran which sort of sums up this sense of the, the unity of God's creation and our sort of place in it. There's a verse in Surah 2130 which reads in the English translation, Do not those who reject faith see that the heavens and the earth were joined together as one unit of creation before we exploded them into existence? And we made all living things of water. Will they not then believe? So that, that verse sort of affirms a unity of creation, that we're all from the same stuff spiritually, but also in terms of being carbon-based or, or whatever, or made of water, as this verse implies. So that, that essential unity of the creation makes me feel very much that we're, we're in a way responsible because we're sentient, we have the ability to have free will. And there's a, a similar verse in the Quran which continues and says, He it is that has made you his stewards on earth. Whosoever subverts this trust does so to the harm of his own soul. So those are two key verses in the Quran just guiding us to the fact that at one level we're part of the, the same stuff around us and we have no superiority, but then we have this ability to act with free will, to actually choose to, to nurture and, and protect. And inter interestingly enough, the word steward um, in the Arabic is khulafa, which the, it's the single of that is um, khalifa. So Khalifa is misconstrued as some sort of caliphate or a, a rather sort of top-down thing. But really, in the Quran, the word is used in the plural, Khulafa, meaning that every individual is that caliph. Every individual is that steward who has that responsibility to, to farm ethically. So to get back to your question, <laughs> what we do on the farm that meets that, well, we try in our humble way to firstly take the production of livestock seriously that we offer ethical, welfare-friendly farming methods where the animals are nurtured for. So we, we try and embody that spirit of caring stewardship. But beyond that, we don't farm with a profit-driven motive. If there's a profit involved, it's the one with the pH. So we, we try and follow the dictates of our religion and the guidance of the example of the prophet and manage the biodiversity around the farm with an equal right. So we, we, we're maintaining hedgerows, we're developing woodland areas for diversity. We're managing the grassland in a more natural way. We, of course, use no chemicals, pesticides, etc. And then there are two other features, actually. The other is, is to try and use the resources we have. So we have a, a program of natural buildings on the farm. A lot of the timber buildings, which we originally built, are using local resources or um, sustainable resources. And the main farmhouse that we ended up building is a, is a massive cob house. I think in America you might call it adobe, which is an earthen material, all derived from the farm. So a very sustainable eco-build and similarly uh, energy production and, and fuel resources. And I'd add the last part of it, which really ties it all together, is the concept of community. We, we try and involve people in the work we're doing here through regular open days, but we have links to the local community, in some cases charitable, where we donate to a homeless refuge in Oxford, and we have other links with community groups to bring them out to the farm. So it's that whole package of creating a set of relationships which sustain communities, environment, uh, and hopefully uh, our family business. <laughs> and there's again a, a saying of the Prophet, which I love because it's so simple, but he simply said, Ad-Din Mu'amala, your religion is your social interaction. So the sum of those sort of relationships partly came out of my academic way of thinking about the environment and managing the environment sort of result in this philosophy of, of trying to make it a holistic way of managing the land. 
Yeah, well, you make it sound like a wonderland. So I think we're all going to quit our jobs promptly and go work on a farm. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you'd be welcome. <laughs> How effective do you think your work has been in sort of being influential? Do you feel like maybe you are the start of something? Do you find yourself chatting with people to, you know, maybe pass on your good decision uh, and see others doing the same? You know, do you feel like the community that you're building is also maybe building out as well? Absolutely. And, and there are two levels. I mean, I'm also, I serve as a trustee for IFES, which is the Muslim Association for highlighting environmental issues and concerns through the, the lens of a Muslim perspective, but also with the outreach involved in that. That's working very much at the international scale, and it's sitting on forums. Um, we're presenting statements and holding interfaith discussions with different religious groups, trying to sort of highlight these issues at an international level. What I do is, is right down at the grassroots level, we're interacting locally. We Just on Friday night, I spent the Sabbath at the local synagogue and discussing these issues of environment and finding so much common ground. I think if you take them to the, the important and ethics, particularly in terms of the environment, we all have this sense of the awe and majesty of the creation as being in some sense, as the Quran would put it, the ayatollah, the, the, the signs of God in the natural world around us. So uh, we work very hard at that level to try and build bridges. Also at the community level, we participate in the local farmers' markets. And in terms of education, we have groups of children coming out to the farm, whether that's Muslim groups from London who we're trying to sort of make them more aware of the sort of issues that they should be addressing, or also bringing mixed groups where we have other faiths and actually creating that sense of understanding that we're not really very different after all. I think that's a, a lovely sentiment and all too true. Something I think easily forgettable is once you actually start talking to people, you find all of the things you have in common, shockingly enough. Absolutely. And that's the real essence because it's so easy to divide on, you know, doctrine, principle, ritual, uh, other aspects of the way that you would sort of organize your life or political beliefs or whatever. But yes, as you strip that away and you actually work together, we had a beautiful uh, experience. It was last year when we actually planted a 200-meter hedgerow along one field. It was actually reinstating an ancient hedgerow that had been there in the older map. And we were fortunate that we contacted the local synagogue and Christian representative, and we had a sort of interfaith planting day where we planted this beautiful hedgerow, which is now going to be there forever, and we'll, we'll lay that using the traditional techniques alongside fellows from different faiths. That's really great. It's funny, I mean, it, it's sort of the one issue that I feel like, you know, science and religion, like, should agree, right? You know, I mean, science is sort of saying, like, okay, we have all this proof that we should take care of the earth. And then religion is sort of saying, yeah, we don't care about the proof. You should just care, care about the earth. It's beautiful, yeah. and it was made for us. <laughs> that, again, is quite important because, you know, we are facing an environmental crisis. And yeah. we don't necessarily have the arguments or the tools to deal with it. And I think this is where we maybe do need to refer back to the different faiths and take a lesson from there, or at least take a, a sense of uh, obligation. Because if we simply base it on a contract, a social contract between us to protect our environment or, or some argument about the future generations, there's always going to be a wise guy who will say, what do we owe the future? Because, you know, there's no re reciprocity. They, they can't do anything for us, so why are we protecting it for them? And that's a serious academic argument. You know, some people put that forward. But more simply, we know that it's just man's nature, that we're all equal, but we're sometimes not all as equal as each other, because that social contract should be protecting not only the environment, but also the, the human dignity, the ability to sustain livelihoods, and that's not always happening. So we need some sort of stronger ethic, which cuts to the core of our individual responsibility, a religious conviction that we should do the right thing, because that is part of our, our sort of definition, our purpose. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point, um, is to actually get your hands dirty, right? Get it, get in and do the work. And finally, we are joined by Buddy Huffaker, board president and executive director of the Aldo Leopold Foundation, here to inform us about the foundation's history and its work in combating climate change. The Aldo Leopold Foundation was started by the five children of Aldo and Estella Leopold in the early 1980s, recognizing that their father's work and philosophy of a land ethic was becoming ever more important uh, and influential. And so when they created the Leopold Foundation, they entrusted it with two primary assets. The first being the farm or the shack, as Leopold uh, references it in a Sand County Almanac, 
that was the family's endeavor to practice restoring land to health. They planted thousands and thousands of pine trees, restored prairie, uh, a sugar maple grove, and other wildlife habitat techniques. And this is where they were working out and testing for themselves how they could take care of the land and make it healthier for wildlife and for themselves. And the other asset that the family entrusted the foundation with was the rights to their father's writing, in particular, a Sand County Almanac. So the foundation has this unique role and uh, honor and, and privilege and challenge of ensuring that Leopold's large philosophy of a land ethic, um, mainly described as humanity recognizing that we are part of the biological community, not apart from it, and therefore uh, we need to extend the same ethical consideration to the flora and fauna as we do uh, our friends and family. So we maintain and help uh, build advocates and interpreters of, of that philosophical and intellectual legacy and, and literary legacy as embodied in a San County Almanac, as well as continue to take care of the very farm that inspired and instilled this land ethic in Leopold. So it's a, a really fun and fascinating uh, effort to kind of keep our hands in the dirt, but our head in the clouds and, and try to connect those two. And that really, I think, is relevant in today's world and society where we're seeing people and humanity more and more disconnected from the natural world uh, and then the outcomes like climate change associated with that. So our work at the foundation is to use uh, the historic site and, and now uh, a landscape of public and private land that is over 10,000 acres where we manage for uh, grassland bird habitat and carbon sequestration, pollinator habitat, uh, and then connect that up with helping new college students get introduced to San County Almanac and start their own intellectual and philosophical journey about how and why they want to take care of the natural world. And the foundation operates out of Baraboo, Wisconsin, uh, just about an hour north of Madison, Wisconsin, where Leopold was a professor in the 1930s and 40s of wildlife management, which started out as game management. He was the first individual ever to teach such a course uh, in North America. And we have people literally come from all over the world now uh, every year to see the place that inspired a San County Almanac and has ensconced that book as a kind of literary classic for anybody who cares to rethink and reimagine what uh, people's relationship to the natural world is. Can you tell us a bit more about a San County Almanac and its impact? It's really exciting to have this new edition of a San County Almanac come out and particularly exciting to have the new introduction by Barbara Kingsolver. I think when readers get the chance to uh, lay their own experience with the book next to Barbara's, they'll see that it is one of these books that creates a big tent. People from any interest in the conservation environmental movement can find themselves in Leopold's writing. I think you find your own values affirmed, but you also see your worldview challenged to think bigger, to think more broadly, to think about the connections between all of us and to the land. And I think that's the, the beauty and the power of Leopold in a San County Almanac is he lets us all find ourselves, but continue to find our way moving forward. And I think that's why it's important for new generations to read a San County Almanac and, and other literature that comes from different perspectives and different voices that you can lay against and compare and contrast. But as we think about where we're at in this human endeavor and, and face uh, challenges like climate change, and massive species extinction, understanding how we at the individual level can contribute, whether it's restoring prairie or planting trees in our own yard or having window boxes, to the collective community action about asking our elected officials to uh, incorporate and pass new environmental policy and legislation. I think Leopold works at all those different levels and lets us 
again, find our unique individual ways to contribute, but also the power of community. And for anybody who's not read Ascent County Almanac, I just think now is the time, uh, and there's never been a better package than uh, having these new contemporary lenses of, of Barbara Kingsolver and, and others who are excited about the reissue of the book uh, to, to take the book to new, to new readers and to new communities uh, as we think about where we're going. Does the foundation work with higher education to include ethics in the curriculum? As the Aldo Leopold Foundation works to ensure that uh, current and future generations are committed to this concept of a land ethic, we've recently completed a survey, a national survey of faculty in higher education, trying to understanding, trying to understand the role of ethics in curriculum associated with environmental science and environmental studies. And the results were really interesting. Uh, the survey respondents, uh, which were representative of um, nationwide uh, programs of this kind, 90 plus percent all agreed that ethics were important and critical to the fields of environmental science and studies. But also 76% said they didn't think they were doing that good of job in including ethics in their curriculum. So this was really illuminating for us to recognize that uh, this, there, there really is this kind of consensus around concepts of a land ethic or land ethics broadly defined uh, in higher education curriculums that are, are graduating our future conservation leaders and thought leaders of all disciplines and how effective we are at, at helping students navigate the world that they're gonna be entering into. So that report we've just released, uh, it uh, identifies and illuminates, again, some, some places and spaces where the Leopold Foundation hopes to contribute. We hope faculty across the country will uh, see this as an opportunity to contribute and collaborate. Um, and it also indicates that on the positive side, a lot of people are already using Leopold and a San County Almanac in particular. And so he is kind of one of the cornerstone voices that helps faculty, whether it's a, a wildlife ecology class or environmental history class or an environmental ethics class to bring ethics into the discourse and the dialogue. Uh, so Leopold really does provide this kind of common starting point uh, the question is, how do we improve, how do we enrich, how do we deepen, how do we diversify uh, the, the tools and the techniques that allow faculty to engage students so that they really are leaving the academy with the ethical decision-making skills and, and references to help find solutions to climate change and other environmental challenges. All right, buddy. Here's your chance to make a pitch to our listeners. How can they build a relationship with the Aldo Leopold Foundation? Well, what I would really ask of listeners is to engage Leopold, to read a San County Almanac. Uh, but in terms of building a relationship with the Leopold Foundation, uh, the first is to go to our website, www.aldoleopold.org, download the report that we've recently released to buy a copy of the San County Almanac. Uh, that really is a, a amazingly powerful kind of common denominator to just know people have that book, that they've read it, that they're sharing it with others. And then finally, consider come visiting us here in Leopold country. Uh, as I described, we have this unique role of, of both trying to be a thought leader around the importance of land ethics, but also implementing it on the very property that inspired a San County Almanac to be written. And so Come in here, seeing spots in the book uh, that might have resonated with you when you read the book or seeing the landscape as it was transformed by the Leopold family. Um, it can be a really powerful experience. I can't tell you, frankly, how many times I've given a tour at the shack and, and a visitor has, has come to tears because a book that has meant so much to them and informed so much about their view of the life and, and maybe even their lifestyle uh, is, is being experienced firsthand. So we like to think that it's an uh, important and powerful uh, stop on one's journey to their own land ethic, and it's, it's really rewarding to have people come from all over the world to see us. 
You're making me want to book my flight out tomorrow. <laughs> we want to thank our featured guests, Ted Steinberg, author of Down to Earth, Bill and Lane, author of The Great Conversation, Lifty Radwan of Willowbrook Farm, and Buddy Hoffaker of the Aldo Leopold Foundation for joining us on this episode of The Oxford Comment. As always, we'd like to thank the crew of The Oxford Comment for their continued assistance on each episode. Be sure to follow The Oxford Comment on Facebook and Twitter to stay up to date on upcoming podcast episodes. Also, please don't forget to subscribe to The Oxford Comment on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. I'm Caitlin Phillips. Thank you for listening. <laughs>